if words were cast in bronze and brass, you'd already know this story. But these words have faded like the greatness of the man they once described into the obscurity of a Northeast Minneapolis basement. This is where John Donaldson's legacy resides today. The basement of Pete Gorton. I study this all the time. I think about this all the time. And the legacy of the greatest baseball player you've never heard of. 20 years before Jackie Robinson broke the major league color barrier, John Donaldson was breaking it in Bertha. Denied access to the major leagues after two solid years in the Negro Leagues, the left-handed hurler was lured away by the money to small-town Minnesota. In 1924, he makes more than all the players on his team, all the payouts to the other teams they played against combined. He filled the stands. Every single time. And the pockets of everyone there. If you had John, Don the famous John Donaldson on your team, he was guaranteed to be talked about statewide. Bertha and Lismore, Melrose, St. Cloud, and Fairmont each signed on Donaldson for a season or more. Barnstorming and exhibitions took Donaldson to 550 North American cities. If he had been white, he would have had a profound major league career, and he would be a household name right now. But no one erects bronze statues, even for dominant pitchers, if you've spent your career town hopping. At best, after death, you're rediscovered. This is just one of the file boxes by Pete Gordon. I've been working on this every day for over 18 years. 18 years. Here's Fremont, Nebraska. Scouring small town papers and museums. Jamestown, North Dakota. Unearthing bits and pieces of Donaldson's 33 year career. Here's a perfect game he throws out in uh, Plenty Wood, Montana. Up to now, we have found 14 no-hitters, 505 wins. We have 5,039 verified strikeouts, um, and every single one of those are in these boxes. There are so many unsung heroes, as we refer to them here at the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. John Donaldson is one of those unsung heroes. He is a player that very few folks knew anything about unless you were a part of that era when he was billed as one of the greatest baseball players of all time. But that era has passed us so many years ago that few know the name John Donaldson. You should, because his numbers were absolutely amazing. And thanks to the work of the Donaldson Network, they built this incredible team of researchers who have gone through now and they brought John Donaldson back to life. No one is going to believe that you could find a Hall of Fame caliber baseball player that nobody knows anything about. Um, this is the case we did that. But the guy with John Donaldson on his men's league uniform. All right, boys, here we go, two down. Won't be done until everyone knows. So his legacy is totally buried here. Everyone. Yeah, yeah left-handed pitcher, greatest black pitcher of all time. He was obviously a major leaguer, not in the major leagues, and not in the major leagues because of his skin color, and that's part of the legacy that we need to restore. A century after John Donaldson's story was first written, right. Pete Gorton is writing a wrong. How can we close the lid on him again? Well, he's been called the greatest baseball player you've never heard of. Well, now at least the people in the small town of Glasgow have. And tonight's MVP, I'll introduce you to a hometown hero and the people making sure he finally gets honored. Sometimes we move so fast, we don't take the time to recognize the past. And that was completely forgotten because of who he was and what he looked like. And that's ridiculous. A record 413 wins and more than 5,000 strikeouts, and still no one knew his name. Never heard of him before. It wasn't known by many people. I mean, I'd heard rumors of this a phenomenal pitcher named John Donaldson. Part of our national pastimes past can present a problem. But yeah. Just ask this man. Wednesday afternoon. From Minnesota. Yep, it's about a 10-hour um, drive from Minneapolis. Pete Gordon has been digging into John Wesley Donaldson for years. So I'm into my 21st year. You have to understand that when I started, nobody knew who he was. Relatively nobody does today. 
Born and raised in Glasgow, Missouri, John Donaldson grew up to become a left-handed legend. There just weren't people throwing the ball the way he was at that time. And he's right here from Glasgow. It is possible that he was an innovator of the art of pitching. Donaldson played more than 30 seasons in the Negro Leagues in the early 1900s, including two years with the Kansas City Monarchs he helped found. And in this rare footage that lasts just 39 seconds, it shows Donaldson pitching in 1925. He strikes out 18 guys that day. Some argue he was one of the greatest of all time. Pete Gordon has the newspaper clippings to prove it. Every time John Donaldson played in Chicago, the newspapers in Chicago said, why isn't he playing for the Chicago Cubs? Why isn't he playing for the Chicago White Sox? He's better than anybody they have, but the color barrier prevented that. Society prevented that. We're simply not going to prevent that anymore. I'm bringing this field to life to honor John Wesley Donaldson. He's getting the recognition he deserves. It's time, and I'm glad it took place, and I am part of it. The community came together, raised the money, and manicured the land donated by Jason Monick's family. I can say, hey, it is never too late to do the right thing. There are probably a whole bunch of stories like this, hundreds, maybe thousands. There could be other communities honoring other people. It's never too late to do that. Donaldson died in 1970, but his family... John Donaldson is my great uncle. ...was there to celebrate this moment. Yeah, this is a very big, important time in history, and I hope people come together over it instead of being divided. The local school district approved a new field named in Donaldson's honor. John, you did it. And erected a statue right beside it. We talked a lot today about being a part of the change. African-American legacies matter in this country. Our effort on behalf of John Donaldson proves that. Speechless. It's, wow. It's, it was a long time coming. And I'm, I'm glad it's here. And it's finally John Donaldson's time to shine. But seeing his face in the sun as it would have been 100 years ago, I've imagined for decades, John Donaldson doesn't have to stand in the shadows anymore. I would not have missed this for anything in the world. What an amazing structure that we have here. In a Bob Kendrick, the president of the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum in Kansas City, occasions like today continue, is among the special guests on hand for the dedication of John Donaldson Field. And at a time in this country when we've been tearing down symbols of hate, they're also unveiling the John Donaldson statue. This community has stepped up to erect a statue of a black man, but not just any ordinary black man, an absolute extraordinary black man, and to welcome their native son back home. Part of our past is hidden behind the wall of segregation. Where equality is forbidden, it's easy to be forgotten. But Pete Gordon is righting a wrong. A piece of the puzzle is coming back to life. He's helped John Donaldson come out of the shadows of history and into the light. The legacy of John Wesley Donaldson can be restored. I'm here today to tell you history has collectively forgotten about him and his impact on who we are today. But this is changing each and every day. John Donaldson said, I'm not ashamed of my color. There is no woman whom I love more than my mother. I am light enough so that baseball men told me before I became known that I could be passed off as a Cuban. One prominent baseball man, in fact, offered me a nice sum if I would go to Cuba, change my name, and let him take me into this country as a Cuban. It would have meant renouncing my family. One of the agreements was that I was to never again visit my mother or have anything to do with colored people. I refused. I am clean morally and physically. I go to my church. I contribute my share. I keep my body and mind clean. And yet when I go out there to play baseball, it's not unusual to hear some fan cry out, hit the dirty N-word. And that hurts, for I have no recourse. I am getting paid, I suppose, to take that. But why should fans become personal? If I act the part of a gentleman, am I not entitled to a little respect? 
It is time to give him what he asked for so many years ago, a little respect. John Donaldson was a ball player. He possessed the physical skills to play at the highest levels of baseball. The segregated era prohibited him from showcasing his talents in the major leagues. In turn, what the major leagues lost was small town America's gain. Equally important, but not equally remembered. Hitters were looking down the barrel of a gun. Today, I will tell you how we at the Donaldson Network are working to solidify the legacy of John Wesley Donaldson and how discovery, compilation, and interpretation will change how we view the legacy of John Donaldson forever. To do this, I'm going to refer to three concepts that I want you to remember. First, Negro League ball players are equal to major league ball players. Second, the greatest colored pitcher in the world. And third, don't take their legacies away again. In the summer of 2000, my former high school social studies teacher, Stephen Hoffbeck, contacted me about a book project called Swinging for the Fences, Black Baseball in Minnesota, a chronology documenting the rich history of black baseball in my home state. Steve had a problem. Nobody wanted to tackle the story of John Donaldson. So with pretty loose expectations, I went to work. In the spring of 2004, the first full chapter on John Donaldson was published. The previous year, the Negro League Baseball Grave Marker Project identified and installed a grave marker for John Donaldson. It reads, a man born before his time. Located at historic Baroque Cemetery in suburban Chicago, Donaldson is interred alongside influential black musicians and civil rights icons, the likes of Dinah Washington, known as the Queen of the Blues, and civil rights catalyst Emmett Till. We were asked to attend the celebration surrounding the installation. As we stood at John Donaldson's grave with a couple of the greatest Negro League historians around, I felt compelled to ask if anyone knew who John Donaldson was. I knew some things and was certain somewhere was someone who could fill in the parts of his career I was unaware of. Everyone assembled at Burr Oak Cemetery in Chicago said no. I felt at the time John Donaldson was an important figure in our shared past and sometimes we must have the courage to do something nobody else will. It's simply not okay to ignore John Donaldson's history any longer. I built a case for his historical significance and some of the factors of why he was unknown compelled me. We were called to begin the defining of a hero of generations and simply one of the greatest baseball careers in the history of sports. The National Baseball Hall of Fame, along with Major League Baseball, commissioned a study to identify the greatest black baseball players from the segregated era. During the summer of 2005, a committee was narrowing a list of pre-league and Negro League stars. The task was to find out as much as possible and submit John Donaldson's career with as much information as we could gather in six short months. How can what was thought of at the time as a legend, a mythical reputation, be encapsulated? Nobody knew, but what I had figured out right away was I had the ability to ask for help. I wrote letters, made phone calls, posted on internet message boards, asking people who knew their hometown history best if they were aware of when the greatest pitcher in the world visited their towns. The answer each time was no. The phenomenon of John Donaldson who had begun. The search of microfilm measured in thousands of feet, working a system of discovery. I was able to develop a research process and gather up evidence of John Donaldson. One example of this came when I happened across an obscure reference. It mentions a newspaper called the Wells Forum Advocate from 1914. Try as I might, checking at the Minnesota State History Center, but the paper was not included in their collections. In 1976, a law was passed as a part of the bicentennial celebration to get historic newspapers saved to microfilm. Bound copies from every corner of the state to benefit historic preservation forever. The Wells Forum Advocate was not included in the collection process. So I asked for help again, this time with local sources. I sent letters to the city and county historical societies, as well as local newspaper offices. The letters described the Wells Forum Advocate and described as much detail of the date, subject, and what we knew of it, just hoping an archive of the paper existed. Soon after, I received a manila envelope in the mail from a woman who described getting my letter and finding the now outlaw newspaper in a dark and dingy back room of a building in rural community of Wells. The story goes, this willing volunteer for the Donaldson Network took the bound volume to the only working Xerox machine in the small farming community and snail mailed it to me, six legal sized black and white copies that when puzzled together, revealed the most extensive reporting on John Donaldson we've ever discovered. This page was doomed to fade over time 
and has now become a most cherished possession. First-hand accounts of no-hitters, abusive local fans, a mother's wish for a son, and thrilled crowds of thousands. No historian of the Negro Leagues had ever seen this hidden away account of the pitcher known as the colored Christy Mathewson. I sat motionless and read of the greatness of John Donaldson, and I packed a bag to go witness this for myself. The Donaldson network of people showed together we could change history. It's been said, when you tell John Donaldson's story, it opens up a window to many other stories. We have certainly discovered this to be true in the hundreds of people we've met. As we continue our legacy restoration for John Wesley Donaldson, who during his time endured being on the outside looking in, and today we stand with him. Together, we will restore his legacy. Okay, the first of our three concepts, Negro League baseball players' abilities were equal to that of Major League baseball players, without doubt. Let's begin with a few of these ball players. The color line systematically eliminated non-white players from the field, forcing them to play somewhere else, anywhere else. Walter Ball personally had the color line drawn on him in three different leagues. George Chappie Johnson played all over the country and starred with Phil the Philadelphia Giants, Chicago Unions, the Page Fence Giants, just to name a few. Bobby Marshall was a powerhouse athlete who not only was a baseball talent, he was a star hockey player too. Marshall was the first black All-American ever in the history of college football at the University of Minnesota. Each would have had major league careers. Only within the last six months has each player been recognized by Major League Baseball as a bona fide major leaguer. December of 2020, Major League Baseball announced the legitimacy of Negro League ball players as significant in the history of our national game. Each of these players were influential in setting the foundation for the career of John Donaldson. In the major leagues, where winning baseball games matters most, owners and managers wanted John Donaldson for their teams. Representatives from the New York Giants, Chicago Cubs and White Sox, Washington Centers, Detroit Tigers, as well as major league affiliates in Colorado, Missouri, Kansas, Nebraska, Iowa, and Minnesota are all known to have endorsed John Donaldson. Each and every franchise knew a lightning throwing shut down left-hander would help them win. Today, John Donaldson is known to have won at least 419 games in his amazing 33 year career that began in 1908 and ended in 1940. Satchel Paige, who 50 years ago this year was the first black baseball player elected to the National Baseball Hall of Fame said in his 1971 induction speech, I had a world of my own. The major leagues didn't want me and this exclusion did not make any difference to Satchel Paige. In the same way, John Donaldson experienced a similar world. This world was not what most people today think it was. This was the world of John Wesley Donaldson. He played in over 744 cities across North America. John Donaldson brought big league quality to this world. Because of segregation, John Donaldson was forced to play anywhere but on a major league field. This meant his considerable talent could only be witnessed in some faraway places. Here's a photo of Beach, North Dakota. Just one example of where the color line forced Donaldson and other great black stars to perform. Somewhere, anywhere, but the lily white major leagues. Let's take a look at the second concept I want you to remember. What made John Donaldson the greatest colored pitcher in the world? John Donaldson was born in 1891 in Glasgow, Missouri. He grew up watching ball games here at Hanukkah's ballpark. Glasgow is a city on the sharpest bend of the Missouri River located in North Central Missouri. John Donaldson was college educated. He attended George R. Smith College in Sedalia, Missouri, a seminary college for the Methodist AME Church. Ida Donaldson, John's mother, wanted him to be a preacher. His baseball abilities would gather him another type of convert, baseball fans. A player of Donaldson's abilities on the field had never quite been seen by fans, and his prophetic message would be deeply centered in equality. After a couple of dominating years as a teenager in Glasgow, where we have yet to find a single game when he had fewer than 15 strikeouts, he joined Brown's Tennessee Rats and immediately began grabbing headlines barnstorming through the Midwest. The Rats played a ball game in the afternoon and entertained with a minstrel show in the evening. Donaldson's record was 41 and three. Papers said John Donaldson was the greatest tosser of tantalizers the locals had ever faced. Some going as far to call him the greatest colored pitcher in America.
1912 was the first season of the World's All Nations. The club was composed of members of several different ethnic groups, and they conducted themselves in true democratic style. They ate, slept, traveled, played ball games, and lived together as a family. Iowan J.L. Wilkinson assembled the team, and his bold entrepreneurship would reserve him a spot in the National Baseball Hall of Fame. Wilkinson, known in black baseball circles as Wilkie, innovated the game. This Pullman coach train car allowed them to make money without breaking any local blue or Jim Crow laws. The All Nations carried the greatest colored pitcher in the world, and they also carried a lighting system for night baseball. Wilkinson had found a portable fuel oil-based light plant called the Swain System on his visit to the Iowa State Fair in 1910. His adaptation revolutionized the game. The All Nations played the first night games ever in every city they visited and showed fans a genuine concept of what the promise of America could be. Together, we will restore his legacy. 1914, the word colored used to qualify John Donaldson in newspaper coverage was removed from descriptions. He was now being called the greatest pitcher in the world. Qualifying statements were automatic in descriptions of African-Americans in black and white articles a subversive way to identify him to the readers of our nation's newspapers. Qualifying statements such as these. The All Nations were sponsored by the Schmelzer's Arms Company of Kansas City. Not only did the store sell guns and ammunition, the team helped get their catalog in front of a baseball crazed public. The ball club acted as a marketing arm and to this day, antique Schmelzer's sporting goods can still be found in the areas where the team traveled. Schmelzer sold uniforms, balls, bats, gloves, and the company's catalog business helped lead the expansion of baseball as our country became baseball mad in the first few decades of the 20th century. The barnstorming all nations led by John Donaldson thrilled crowds across the countryside. He was the living face of the catalog company. Donaldson was the star for their catalog business. Correlations can be made to Nike and Michael Jordan some 75 years later. Incidentally, the big three major sports of that time were baseball, boxing, and fly fishing. Here are a couple of interesting photos from Alexandria, Minnesota, showing a transformed ballpark when a barnstorming club came to town. Notice the fence requiring the locals to pay to watch, a key element for the world's all nations team looking to maximize their profits playing baseball. Soon, John Donaldson would become a sensation wherever the Schmelzer's Arms Company booked a game. His $150 a month salary meant he made a very good living as a ball player. It was said he used his money to build a decent home for his mother. He struck out more than 500 batters per year from 1912 through 1914 and probably included a fourth season in 1915. The major league record for strikeouts in a season is 383 held by Nolan Ryan, and he pitched those in 1973. With the All Nations, Donaldson pitched seven of his known 14 no-hitters. His lightning fastball was one of four major league quality pitches that he threw, the others being a changeup, curve, and what has become known as a slider. John Donaldson's slider could get any hitter out in any era, anywhere. Statistics show history a newly discovered record of what John Donaldson did, but the film footage you watched provides the answers needed for full legacy restoration. The question of Donaldson's physical ability can now be answered. His legacy is not dependent on faded newspaper headlines alone. What made John Donaldson the greatest left-handed power pitcher of his era, black or white? Here is what major league scouts reported made John Donaldson special. Donaldson's legs were very powerful, the source of his lightning fastball. Batters said often the ball looked the size of a pea when it reached the plate. More than two decades prior to the same analogy, used to describe Satchel Paige's fastball. Donaldson was desired by major leagues because of his physical ability, not whom he played against or piled up stats against. The film footage proves this. Together, we can reassemble and restore the legacy of John Donaldson. In 1916, the Chicago Defender stated what we know as obvious today. The All Nations have demonstrated to the world one thing in particular, that it is possible for black and white to play professional baseball in harmony on one team. We didn't just realize this fact in 1947 when Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier 31 years later. This singular one of 8,000 known articles about the career of John Donaldson blames Chicago baseball owners, saying it is their own fault that their teams were unsuccessful and color phobia 
keeps the Cubs and Sox from success on the field. In 1916, John Donaldson challenges segregation in baseball, yet continues to live as a black man in his own world, a black man in America. On November 7th, 1917, Donaldson married Eleanor Watson. Newspapers rave, the race's greatest baseball pitcher and one of its most charming young women to be married. It was the start of a union that lasted until John's death in 1970, 53 years later. Today, Eleanor Watson's grave has no marker. Her resting place is not far from that of her husband. The Donaldson Network is dedicated to providing a marker for Eleanor Watson Donaldson, and we are looking for financial contributions to sustain this effort, our effort to restore John Donaldson's legacy. World War I changed the customary manner a barnstorming team traveled. The Great War brought about changes to the landscape of baseball, both in the white leagues and indeed baseball at every level. What did John Donaldson do? He sought employment with clubs in major American cities, Los Angeles, Indianapolis, Brooklyn, New York, and Detroit, where he was known as the highest salaried colored pitcher in the universe, the strikeout king, the world's greatest southpaw pitcher. He played in major league cities. He possessed proven major league talent. In 1920, the pitcher with the most strikeouts to his name, walking on planet Earth, John Donaldson, is a founding member of the now infamous Kansas City Monarchs, set to play in the newly formed Negro National League, the first sustained league of its kind in history and celebrated in 2020 for its 100th anniversary. It was said that John Donaldson suggested the team name to owner J.L. Wilkinson. Donaldson's five-tool ability anchored the Monarchs, pitching, playing center field, and even batting cleanup. Shortly after the founding of the Negro National League, the Monarchs ran into financial trouble, a position nearly any new business venture might. These financial woes forced management to look for alternate incomes, and the decision was made to send John Donaldson back to the money-making barnstorming routes of the previous decade. This time with Donaldson as the player manager of the retooled All Nations, acting as a proving ground for future Monarchs. In 1922 and 23, the All Nations team made money for the Monarchs, traveling the Midwest. Donaldson was a known profit maker outside of the Negro National League, and this lessened his dependence on it. The headline reads, Donaldson quits Monarch Club. In 1924, Donaldson leaves the Monarchs, probably tired and facing another summer with the All Nations traveling now by automobile, but certainly due to his contract. In Bertha, Minnesota, the local business leaders, eager to entice the black Christy Matthewson, started a special bank account and began saving for Donaldson's contract three years earlier. With John Donaldson as their star pitcher, the Bertha Fisherman won the Minnesota State semi-professional title in 1924. The daily newspapers from Minneapolis and St. Paul reported on nearly every game. This brought fame and recognition to Bertha and the region. Bertha's management banked on it. Donaldson made $1,478 that summer and his record was 21 and three. His salary was more than all of his teammates combined. Donaldson's baseball career faced particularly trying times in the late 1920s as he organizes more barnstorming teams. One proposed club was to include Swede Risberg and Happy Felsch in the wake of the Chicago White Sox alleged throwing of the 1919 World Series. The racially barred Donaldson and the lifetime banned and disgraced Black Sox never materialized, but traveling teams needed to show creativity during this time in order to survive. One typical day traveling on the dusty roads of North Dakota, it was a rare off day for John Donaldson. The All Nations were handling the local club on the field when the crowd in the grandstand began chanting, we want Donaldson. At that point, a grease covered man stepped from a clump of trees where the travelers had parked their cars in the shade. John Donaldson was performing maintenance on their touring cars. The tall lanky figure clad in coveralls wiped the grease from his hands and took the mound. He obliged the fans by striking out his opponent on three straight pitches. The ever gracious Donaldson proceeded to acknowledge the crowd by tipping his cap and went back to doing his job, cleaning spark plugs on a trusted but rickety Packard twin six. Donaldson's ability to make money during this period was unlike any other black baseball star. His monthly salaries were said to have topped $750 a month. John Donaldson was a major league star exiled in small town America. John Donaldson's All-Stars formed in 1930. The club cashed in on his fame and reputation, which included head-to-head matchups against his former team, the Kansas City Monarchs. 
Eventually, John Donaldson would don the Monarch jersey again and rejoin Wilkinson's organization. One more extremely important fact about John Donaldson's playing career is he became a traveling secretary for Satchel Paige in the late 1930s. Donaldson's experience, contacts, knowledge of lucrative barnstorming routes of the Midwest helped build the legacy that we know today as Satchel Paige. John Donaldson mentored hundreds of black ball players throughout his career, but none compared to Satchel Paige. Page is known to have suffered an arm injury serious enough that Wilkinson gave him one more shot at recovery and called on John Donaldson to work him back into shape. With John Donaldson's ever watchful eye, Satchel's arm slowly recovered and kept on pitching for an astounding two and a half decades, including a World Series championship. In 1947, while working in the Chicago post office, Donaldson watched as Jackie Robinson broke the color line surrounding the game for over 70 years. On June 22, 1949, the Chicago White Sox hired John Wesley Donaldson as the first full-time black scout in Major League Baseball history. He scouted some of the greatest players ever, Willie Mays, Henry Aaron, Ernie Banks. He signed dozens of players destined to integrate the game. His perseverance within the game lasted nearly a half a century, leading to his retirement, where he was known to have continued teaching the game to children at Washington Park as a coach within the Chicago Parks Department the greatest colored pitcher in the world, indeed. Together, we will restore his legacy. Paul Efert was a catcher with the St. Louis Cardinals organization in the early 1920s. He retired from pro ball to raise sheep on a farm near St. Cloud, Minnesota. Paul knew John Donaldson and caught for him many times. Paul had soft hands, the kind of hands it took to catch lightning. Paul was tragically killed in an accident as he tried to cross the street when he was hit by a car. He left a wife, Mabel, and two small children. His son Herman was three and his daughter Faith was five. Mabel put together a scrapbook for her children. It included a letter from John Donaldson. Herman Efert never really knew his father or anything about his baseball career. With a tear in his eye, the now aged Herman shared this letter with me. John Donaldson wrote, if your son wants to play ball, I would do all I could to encourage him. He may be a big leaguer. The letter was filled with insights into Paul Efert. An amazing, handwritten letter, not because it relates to stories of ball fields, paydays, and conquest, but because it provides us with a glimpse of John Donaldson, the human being. He wrote, remember me to Faith and Herman. John Donaldson entrusted Mabel the responsibility to include him in the story of her fallen husband. He continued, old ball players don't die, they just fade away. Donaldson wrote this on his official White Sox stationery. I'm here today to tell you in historical context this is exactly what happened to the greatest colored pitcher in the world. This is what happened to the great John Wesley Donaldson. He faded away. Now for our third concept. The color line prohibited Negro League players the opportunity to have lasting legacies in the eyes of history. Our segregated society ensured John Donaldson would fade away. I'm here today to reassure you that we are not going to let this happen. We cannot allow modern memory to nullify its contributions. We must restore, not marginalize. Our segregated past, this historical stain, can no longer hold John Donaldson. However, today there is a problem with John Donaldson's legacy. Critics and skeptics judge his career stating it this way, and it is simple dismissal of one of the all-time greats. This determination is based on where he played, not how he played. They said it was impossible to find records of players during Donaldson's time, but this is no longer true. Proof of this from the Minneapolis Star columnist Dick Cullum back in 1971. We built the Donaldson Network with legacy restoration as our goal. How do you find the data that makes legacy restoration possible? By asking for help, help from people literally around the world. We began searching out each and every instance of John Donaldson, three plus decades of playing. Over 500 authors, researchers, and baseball historians have joined the ranks of the Donaldson Network. We have collected information from 31 different states and provinces, totaling nearly 2,500 games. We have nearly 8,000 articles related to the career of John Donaldson. I think that's a lot, but it's not about what I think. It's about how we share it. So you can decide for yourself. We built our site to now include all 419 wins and 5,164 documented strikeouts for John Donaldson. Newspaper references of published proof he played, pitched, struck out, and won every single game. We have found the games and the career thought to be impossible. We have documented segregated baseball's largest individual total in the history of the game. 
Here's a single example of one of his games, a 30 strikeout game in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. It gives the date, location, and strikeouts along with all known references to the game. And it's the best cumulative reference available. It is proof. We did this to show how it is possible to document Negro League players. Now you can decide for yourself where John Donaldson fits in the history of baseball. It is absolutely out there. Most recently, the Donaldson Network has gone about our legacy restoration effort by producing short films to tell his story. Our YouTube channel contains more than a dozen three to five minute films. To date, they have been viewed more than 7,000 times. If this story compels you, please take a look at how we are restoring the legacy one viewer at a time. It is time, time to return him to his rightful place in the eyes of history. In 2017, John Wesley Donaldson was inducted into the Missouri Sports Hall of Fame. I encourage each one of you to contribute to this effort by letting people know John Donaldson's legacy belongs with the greatest to ever play the game. Here are a few other examples of why we know this. On April 19, 1952, the Pittsburgh Courier published their list of black baseball's all-time greats. The five pitchers selected were Bullet Joe Rogan, William Foster, Smokey Joe Williams, Satchel Paige, and John Donaldson. John Donaldson remains the only pitcher from the poll not enshrined in the National Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York. You say, well, that's just a single poll. John Donaldson is mentioned in different all-time Negro League polls as an all-time great in 11 consecutive decades. From 1920 till today, the polls have told of the greatness of John Donaldson. In 2006, the Hall of Fame had a special election for contributors associated with the Negro Leagues. John Donaldson's name was one of 39 on the final ballot. He was left out when 17 others associated with the Negro Baseball Leagues got their call to Cooperstown. In 2016, the president of the Baseball Hall of Fame told the Sporting News, 17 contributors in the Negro Leagues who were elected in 2006, that would be the final election for those who performed in the Negro Leagues, unless, unless new research came out to warrant another look. Well, let's take another look, shall we? In 2006, historians judged John Donaldson's worthiness on his known information and statistics. At the time, he was known to have 148 wins. Today, we possess and can prove 419. For those scoring at home, that's 271 more. Back then, John Donaldson was known to have 2,245 strikeouts. As of today, 5,164. Many more than twice the known strikeouts, and the numbers continue to rise. In the summer of 2016, the Hall of Fame again made it possible for players from the Negro Leagues to be considered. So John Donaldson will have another shot at baseball immortality in 2021. Remember, Donaldson's physical ability, the film footage, is now known, as is his reasoning for exiting the Negro National League back in 1924, and Donaldson's status as the first Black scout in Major League Baseball history. The 2006 designation of him as worthy of the final ballot of 39 separates him from many potential future candidates. These factors, in my opinion, should allow John Donaldson to again be discussed for possible induction into the National Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown. But don't take my word for it. Listen to what Negro League's great Buck O'Neill wrote in his autobiography. John Donaldson showed Satchel Paige the way. And the fact is, there are many people who saw them both who say John Donaldson was just as good as Satchel. And Hall of Fame owner of the Kansas City Monarchs, J.L. Wilkinson, said Donaldson was, quote, the greatest pitcher that ever threw a baseball, black or white. John McGraw, the manager of three-time World Series champion New York Giants, called John Donaldson the greatest pitcher in the world. Recently, John Donaldson was selected to the 2020 Negro Leagues All-Centennial Team, a team celebrated by the Negro League Baseball Museum in Kansas City, along with a bobblehead doll to commemorate his many accomplishments. With the support of local organizations, we raise hundreds of thousands of dollars built John Donaldson Field in Glasgow, which includes a statue of John Wesley Donaldson. We dedicated the statue and field safely in the fall of 2020 amid the ongoing pandemic, a moment in our history that continues to be felt to this very day. So who was John Donaldson? A major league quality player, a casualty of the color line, a baseball legend with a known legacy for proof, a hometown hero, a possible future Hall of Famer, but most important, John Donaldson was a man. A man whose legacy is worthy of a little respect, our respect, yesterday, today, tomorrow, and into the future. Thank you.